Merry Christmas, Redemption Church. How are we doing this morning? And we're so glad that you are with us. And uh, today we're going to spend some time in Matthew chapter 1 looking at a part of the Christmas story. And uh, I'm sure that every one of us actually has some Christmas memories that you will never forget. Uh, 2017 was one of those years uh, for me and Steph. At that point, we've been married for around 13 years with no children. And then 2017, uh, that Christmas was the first Christmas that we had our three foster babies, eventually the three children that we adopted. There were four, three, and two uh, at that time. And what's so uh, memorable for me about that Christmas is, is a picture that pops up every year in the month of December uh, to remind me of that day, and it's a picture of my youngest son, Johnny, who was two years old uh, at the time, and I have a picture to show you, to show you so you can check it out, okay? And so he's got his hand in his pocket, his finger in his nose. Um, he, again, uh, was 100% deaf here, and so he had no cochlear implants at the time, and, and these were clothes he got for, from Christmas, and uh, he had them on. He's almost like, I don't know why, with kids that are this size, uh, 18 pounds at two years old, we treat them like dolls. And they get like, they change their clothes like four times a day, right? To wear different outfits, right? For all the grandparents around, right? And uh, so that's what I'll never forget that Christmas because for years it was much quieter for us on Christmas morning than it became on this day. And so this day's a memory uh, for me that I will never forget. Question, who will be with you this Christmas? Who will be with you this Christmas? You see, I think Christmas time is, is often a time to celebrate who you will see, but it's also a time to mourn who you will miss. As a kid, we grew up going to Florida every Christmas. I don't know how many in a row we went to Florida because both sets of my grandparents were down there, and I have great memories of that. But for Steph and I, uh, we don't have any grandparents that are, that are still alive today, right? And so there's, there's missed, those who are missed as we gather with our families, right? And there's joy in who is there, and there's sorrow in who's actually missing. You see, I think Christmas time is a time to remember, right? You see, I think the Christmas story actually speaks to the joy that we have in this season, and it speaks to the pain that we experience in this season. And I want us to look at the story in Matthew chapter 1, and I'm going to pick it up halfway through the story, starting in verse 21. It says this, speaking of Joseph, uh, angel speaking to Joseph, show about Mary. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And so we're, we're jumping partway into the story this morning of when we learn how that Joseph actually learns that Mary is actually uh, pregnant. The story starts in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and it tells us that Mary and Joseph were betrothed to be married. And what that means is they were engaged. It was a year-long engagement, and it ended in a week-long wedding ceremony with all their friends and their family. And so imagine the excitement, right? Imagine the vision that they would have had for their life. If you go back to when you were married, all these goals that you wanted to accomplish, these plans, things you wanted to do and see, right, and, and get after the world together. But then before the ceremony ever started, Joseph learns that Mary is actually with child. She is pregnant. So what do you think Joseph is thinking, and what would you be feeling if you were him? You see, I think you'd be feeling heartbreak, potentially betrayal. I think you'd be feeling humiliation. Maybe you can relate to your life, a time in your life when your dreams came crashing down, when the plans you thought they were going to become reality never became reality. So what is Joseph going to do? You see, Joseph in Matthew 1 is described as a just man. So when he learns that Mary is pregnant, he doesn't actually want to shame her. You see, in the culture of the day, he could have had Mary dragged out to the, to the center of town and they could have all picked up stones and they could have stoned her. Because the evidence is this, 
She's committed the sin of adultery. But Joseph didn't want to do that. Again, he was a just man, and he wanted to treat Mary how he would want to be treated if he was found out in his own sin. And so while he was pondering about what to do, about how to respond to this, an angel of the Lord appears to him, and it says this. The angel says, fear not. Fear not, Joseph, for the child that Mary is carrying is conceived from the Holy Spirit. What's happening here? Listen, God has been silent for over 400 years, and now he's breaking his silence, and he's telling Joseph this. I have a vision for what's happening here that is so much bigger than this you and Mary. You see, it's a vision that he promised all the way back in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 when he told Satan to his face that I'm going to send a Savior who's going to destroy you. In fact, in verse 22, which we read, it says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And so what was happening was actually God's plan. So here's the truth. God's vision was bigger than a stoning. God's vision was bigger than a quiet divorce from Mary. God had a vision of redemption. And we read the story and the angel gave Jesus a title. Did you catch it? It was the title, Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? Well, the story told us. Emmanuel is literally three words. That means God with us. The word Emmanuel, the title, shows up two times in the Old Testament. It shows up one time in the New Testament. This definition is significant for you and I. So here's the question. What does it mean when Emmanuel means, and Emmanuel says, God with us? What do those three words actually mean? And here's what I want, to, I want you to know. No matter how you came in this morning, if this is a season of great joy for you and your family, or maybe this is a season of great pain, I want you to understand something, that the title Emmanuel provides great hope to us all. God with us. And so this morning, I want us to break this, 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 uh, these three words down, starting with God, the salvation from uh, the greatest person. And I want us to see again what verse 21 says. It says, she will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then verse 23 says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they, meaning people, not just the Lord, but not just Joseph, not just Mary, everybody, they will call his name Jesus. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Church, the gospel is centered on the person of God. And the gospel would not be good if God was not at the center. It would cease to actually be good. So let me be clear. God is not an idea. God is a person. And the only way that we can understand who God is is actually through his attributes. And God has, God has um, shared attributes that we can share amongst ourselves. But God also has unshared attributes that only belong to him. Nobody else. And so these attributes that make up who he is, his shared attributes and his unshared attributes, literally reveal so much to us about how great God is. So what does it mean for God to be great? Listen, in our world, um, greatness has categories, doesn't it? We can say, oh, that thing is great. Well, what thing? Oh, that house that you bought, that's a, that's a great house. Or that car that you bought, that's a great car. Or that vacation you went on, that, that's a great vacation. But those things don't compare to one another. You see, we have categories for everything that we label to be great in our life. And typically, it comes down to how much money we're going to spend on that specific category of greatness. We could talk about the greatest movies or the greatest bands We could talk about another category, my favorite, food, right? We could talk about pizza, how great pizza is. Well, what does that mean? That has categories. Is it Chicago style? Is it New York style? Is it Detroit style? Like what kind of pizza would actually be great in your mind? We actually have categories for people being great. Do you know that? They're talking about musicians or we're going to talk about athletes, right? The greatest athlete of all time in a specific sport, right, has the title the GOAT. Right? The GOAT is the acronym for greatest of all time. And so if you're a basketball fan, Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. He's the GOAT. Now, if you're like 25 and under, you never really probably saw Michael Jordan play. And so you might think someone else is the GOAT. You're just wrong. It's okay. Okay? It's okay. You're wrong. We love you. You're welcome. Right? But we have categories for greatness. Everything in our life fits into, fits into something. 
But what if I told you that the greatness of God doesn't fit into one of our categories? What if I told you that God's greatness doesn't just fit in the categories that we've actually created? And what if the greatness of God literally trumps every category in our life? And so what do I mean by that? Let's talk about for a minute just three of God's unshared attributes. The first is this, is that God is eternal. God is measureless. He has zero limitations. God is Being eternal means he has no beginning, he has no end. He lives in eternity past, which which means he has no future. He doesn't have a tomorrow. He's already lived all of tomorrow. He's sovereign over everything in life. He sees all the beginning and all the end at the exact same time. That's an unshared attribute. But God is also infinite. And like I already said, he's, he's measureless. He has zero limitations. He has zero imperfections. He has unlimited knowledge. He has unlimited wealth. He has unlimited energy. But we can share a third one, that God is holy. That's an unshared category. He is outside time and space. He's not trapped like you and I are. He, he does not need you, and he does not require you. And because he's holy, there's nothing that you and I could ever do to actually appease him. How can we appease a holy God? We have nothing of value or interest of, or worth to actually offer him. And I often think our half-hearted approaches would disappear if we remember the God that we're actually approaching. Do you realize that holiness dictates how he can be approached? Holiness sets the terms of the relationship. So when we hear that God is great, what do we do? We bring him down into our human sphere of understanding. So we have the house category and the car, the car category, and, and we, have, we have the vacation category, and then we have the band category and the, and the food category, and then we have the God category. Of all the gods, he is great. That's not how it's actually supposed to work. You see, I think we often want contract negotiations with God. God, if you do blank, then I will do. Ever done that? Ever try to inform God of how this relationship is going to work going forward? Ever try to tell God, I'll give you this part of my life, but not, not give you all of my life? You're trying to dictate what greatness can and cannot do in those moments. And here's the reality. How do we relate to a God who's eternal, infinite, and holy? Why do we want to dictate what he can do or actually not do? And so the truth is greatness is actually a word that's created in our, in our human language to describe what we believe to be true about God. Here's the beautiful thing about Christmas. Christmas is this reminder that God keeps his promises. So think about this. When Jesus was born and he came to earth, he brought with him all that God actually is. He brought with him all the shared attributes and he brought them quickly into this world. He brought his unshared attributes with him. It was a holy God, an eternal God, an infinite God that was actually born in this moment. And we got to experience his shared attributes in that moment that this eternal God is also a God of love, a God of hope, a God of peace. I got a joy, Advent, the words that we celebrate around the Christmas season, and it's an infinite love and an infinite joy, and it's a holy love and a holy joy. All of those things collided in the birth of Christ. Which means this then. If you know Christ, nothing can rob you of what he, of what he offers you. Yes, we need a God that's eternal but we also need a God that's love. Yes, we need a God that's infinite, but we also need a God that's peace and hope and joy. And in Christ, we have all of those things. So just my encouragement this morning is, can we just be overwhelmed for a moment through all the pain that we experience in this life about who our God actually is? This season brings joy and pain, but remember, Emmanuel, God with us. What's, what's the with Right, what's the width? The width is the security of the greatest presence. Look at verse 23 again, just to see it with your own eyes. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with 
us. And so God told uh, Joseph that Mary's going to give birth to a son, to a child. He will be Emmanuel. You are to call his name Jesus, but Emmanuel simply means God with us. You see, the gospel starts with God. Did you realize that the Christmas story reveals the heart of the Father? It wasn't just that God came. It was God with. The word with is so vital into the statement because the word with signifies that God wants relationship with you. And how do we understand the word with? Listen, it brings forth the beauty and the wonder of the incarnation because in the incarnation, we learn how far God is willing to go to be with you. It's incredible. The word with is, is so vital to the gospel. Now, the world at the time, Mary and Joseph, theologically would have believed that, that God was with Moses when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, that God was with King David when he reigned on the throne, that God's presence was found in the temple, that they could go to Jerusalem and, and actually go and find God. But here's what was happening. Something different was happening in this very moment. This wasn't something now for us to go and find because what was happening is that God was coming to us. God with. And even though God is eternal and God is infinite and God is holy, that's the God that actually came to earth and it communicates that he wants to be with you. And so there's a gospel promise in the word with that is vital for each and every one of us to understand. And that is this, if God is with you, God is for you. If God is with you, God is for you. And when you realize that God is with you, and then you realize that God is actually for you, it's actually a life-changing statement, this word, with. Because when God is with you, what does that mean? That means there's nothing in your life that you face in this world that God does not join you in. Nothing. Not a single thing. That means you're never alone. In your greatest wins, God is there. In your greatest failures, God is there. In your greatest sin, God is there. In your greatest mistakes, he's with you. Why would God be with me in those moments? Because God is for you. That's what the word with actually means. God with us. He's on your side. God's on your team. And if this wasn't true, the gospel would cease to be good. And so God being Emmanuel is absolutely best for us. In the season of joy and in the season of pain, remember Emmanuel, God, secondly, with, and third, us. The word us, the solution for our greatest problem. We already read the verses, so we won't do it again, but question, where do you find yourself in the story? Because here's the reality. You can never understand who you are apart from who God actually is. If you want to know who you are as a man, as a woman, as a human, it requires us to have an accurate picture of who our God is, that he is holy and he's eternal and he's infinite. He's other than us. When we get that glimpse, it's so important to the gospel because that then reveals who we actually are. Yet we understand in the story, it says, for he, Jesus, will save his people from their sins. Question, how does God actually save us? The answer is Emmanuel. He saves us by becoming us. And we all have many problems in our life. And some of you have work problems. And some of you have relationship problems with family and friends. And some of you are having marital problems. Some of you have financial problems. Right? Th those things are all reality and they're all true. Let me be clear. None of those problems have defined us in our past. The greatest problem that you and I have ever had in our life is that we are sinners. We've rejected the Lord. That's our greatest problem. And we can solve all sorts of problems in our life. Through humility, we can, we can maybe heal relationships. We can make better financial decisions. We can grow in our roles as a spouse or a parent. There's always hope for those problems. Let me be clear. Without Jesus, there is no hope for sinners. There is no hope for sinners. You see, we have rejected the greatness of God. And we've declared that we want to be God. 
And so the Christmas story is a reminder to sinners of not only what God gives, but, but what we get to receive. I'm sure there's people in the room that would prefer to receive a gift versus give a gift. I'm sure there are some who love to give over receive. I don't know if anyone in the room's ever been given a re-gift before. Uh, years ago, a year before my wife and I were married, uh, she went to a friend's wedding. She bought two things off her registry. One of those things was a candle. And then um, at our wedding, we realized that all she did was package up that candle that we bought for her wedding for her that was on her registry list that wasn't on our registry list, and she gave it back to us as a gift. <laughs> right? The good old re-gift. So think about what happened in the story. Steph bought a gift, gave the gift, received the gift back. She bought her own wedding gift from her friend. Yeah. Here's the crazy part in the Christmas story. Jesus is the gift given to every single sinner, and you just have to decide if you want to receive it or if you're going to reject it. That's it. Are you going to receive it or are you going to reject it? Why would you not want to receive God with us? God, eternal, infinite, holy, the with, right? He's so for you, he came to be with you. Like, that's absolutely stunning. That's incredible to think about the truth of the Christmas story. And I, I'm blown away that God would actually want that. Are you? Why would God want us? You see, what an eternal God should be doing, in my, in my opinion, is actually turning his love away from us. But in Christ, he turns his love towards us. Through the birth of Emmanuel, God with us. Our gospel takeaway this morning is this, is that God with us wants to be God with you. And in verse 24 in the story, it tells us that Joseph awoke and from his sleep and did all that the Lord had commanded him to do. Jesus was born. He calls his name Jesus. And so the truth of the matter is this. I, I care less about what Joseph did in that moment because we know that. The greatest question is what are you going to do? Have you accepted the gift of Emmanuel, of God with us? It's literally a life-changing acceptance. It's a free gift that you can't purchase and you can't earn. It's freely offered from the Lord through the birth of a child. And so the Christmas story is a story of good news about a Savior who was born to save sinners. What do I mean by that? Let me break it down. Here's the first thing. Jesus became you. He became you. He took on all our sin. He took all our shame. He lived a perfect life. And not only did he become you, that's not enough. Jesus went the distance for you. Right? He went the distance for you. And he was nailed to your cross and he was nailed to my cross and he died a sinner's death. And why, why did he become us? And, and why did he go the distance for us? And, and the answer is to rescue you. That's what we saw in the story. Jesus will rescue sinners from their sin. He's the savior of the world. He's the hero of the scriptures. And he should be the hero of our lives. He's the center of the gospel. He's the center and the head of the church of Jesus Christ. And he should be the center and the head of all of our lives. He owes, we owe our life to him. We owe our worship to him. He deserves everything from us. He should be our passion and we should be urgent about him to take the gospel message to a dying world. He's the God we love and the God we need. He came through for us in our darkest moment, in our greatest need. He's done for us what nothing can ever do for you and what nothing can ever do for us. He gave his life for us. He's Jesus. He's Emmanuel. He's God with not just us. He's with you. Do you know him, friend? Do you know him? This is the Christmas story. It's at the heart of the gospel. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for your love for us. I want to thank you for the chance as a church family to celebrate the birth of Jesus. that you became us, you wrapped yourself in flesh, you entered into your creation as the eternal and infinite and holy king. You stared us in the face. You took our sin on. We didn't even ask you to do that. 
We weren't interested in you. We weren't looking for you or pursuing you, yet you came to us to do what only you could do. And because of that, we offer our life to you, Lord. I want to pray this morning for people in the room that don't know Jesus, that don't know you as Savior, Lord, that you are a God who wants to be with them. This is not just about eternity. This is about now, Lord. That you join us in the ups and downs of this world, that you have purpose and, and, and uh, a vision for everything that we see and face in our life. And so I want to pray for those in the room who don't know Jesus as Savior, that today's the day they'll confess their sin They'll confess their need for a rescuer, for a savior, someone who's greater than them, someone who's perfect, who actually died in their place. That they too can experience not just purpose in this world, but also an eternity with you because you are a God of forgiveness. And so I'm so grateful for the word Emmanuel. God with us. Amen.